I want you to watch this interview between Paul Joseph Watson and Candice Owens. It's on Paul Joseph Watson's YouTube channel. They are both huge figures on social media. It's a very important point to say at the outset. They have millions of people engaging with their content every week. And I find that all the more extraordinary because what they're saying, as you're about to find out, is completely nuts and almost always evidence-free. And if you think that should change in 2021, if you would like Navarra Media to have a platform bigger than these guys, hit the subscribe button. But let's see what they've got to say in this latest round of unhinged right-wing bat shittery. COVID-19, we have seen um, suddenly that you cannot question who, you cannot question the CDC. Um, and, and questioning them whatsoever can lead to censorship of even doctors, right? Remember the YouTube videos of doctors who were going and talking about what they were seeing um, as they were treating patients, patients with COVID-19, doctors that were against the lockdowns, um, you know, doctors that were saying that vitamin C um, you know, mass you know, mega doses of vitamin C could help cure this. Vitamin so C. this entire predicament of COVID-19, no matter which way you look at it, there we have a problem. We have a very, very real problem in terms of a free society that is not able to get any truth about this uh, alleged infectious disease that it has been worse, have been, has been worth, has been worth shutting down virtually all of Western society. And I say Western society because it's fascinating to consider that it's only the West that has been this lockdown for this long, yes. we're supposed to believe that China, as you just mentioned, we're learning now today, CNN is saying, oh, they covered some deaths. We're supposed to believe that China only took, what was it, a month before they reopened? Was it a couple of weeks before they were able, able to reopen their society and people were able to get back to work? Um, so I have been talking about this for a very long time, and it is shameful um, that the media has been participating in censoring so much information um, from valid sources regarding what sort of a predicament we're actually in. There's a lot here to unpack. I mean, she's still clearly saying that she doesn't actually think this is a, a real pandemic. She says alleged infectious pandemic. She still clearly doesn't think this is actually real. 305,000 people have died in the United States from COVID-19. 305,000. It's already overtaken combat deaths, so it's equal to combat deaths from World War II for the United States. You've then got missing in action disease. That's around 400,000. It's going to overtake that as well. And yet she doesn't seem to think it's real. Concerning. But then she says, well, the East Asian countries, which is correct, have dealt with this so much better than we have. You know, they've not had to shut down their entire economy like we have for the best part of for nine months. Why do you think that was, Candies? Because they were mega dosing on vitamin C? No, it's because they were dealing with the pandemic in a fundamentally different way to us. You know, she, she goes so far and then she doesn't go all the way. You're absolutely right. The political class of Vietnam, of China, of South Korea, of Japan have dealt with this so much better, not just in the United States, but everyone in Europe. And the reason why is very simple. It's the third novel coronavirus to hit Asia over the last 20 years. So of course, as societies, they're going to be better equipped to deal with this. But fundamentally, it boils down to the role of the state for these societies. Take someone like Vietnam. It's a very poor country. It has this huge land border with China, and yet it's not had anything like the shutdown you see in the US or in Europe. Why is that? It's because the state looks at a problem and it solves it really quickly, whether it's literacy, clean drinking water, or in this case, dealing with a pandemic. We see something similar with Cuba because the test and trace systems they're deploying are very human intensive. And if you have a top-down hierarchical government, I don't think it's good for everything. In a pandemic, it's a really useful thing to have. So I'm not quite sure what she's trying to say here. You've got this strange contradiction. On the one hand, she's overtly saying that East Asians have dealt with this better than we have. On the other hand, she's talking about vitamin C and the media failing. So what, if, if we didn't have the media censorship, if she was allowed to talk this nonsense on Facebook, we would be like South Korea and Japan, really, not having a single fatality for months on end? I find that hard to believe. No, you mentioned China. I've got an article out today. China to enjoy better post-COVID economy than all other major nations. They're out there having pool parties in Wuhan. They're at the nightclubs, no masks, no social distancing. Their GDP this year is set for a 1.8% increase. The US is going to be down 3.7%. Meanwhile, in the US, you've got Amazon adding 427,000 employees between January and October throughout this pandemic. You've got small businesses going bust. Yep. They've lost an average 30% of their income over the past six months. So the only people benefiting out of this economically 
are Amazon, Walmart, Target, and all these big retailers who everyone has now become completely dependent upon as if they weren't dependent on them enough. And China, which went from literally putting out videos of people convulsing and collapsing in the street back in January, which all we all freaked out about, that was obviously some kind of propaganda designed to make the West overreact to the COVID pandemic. And now we're in this situation where we can't even talk about it. I want to bring I, it out to I the fact. Like to say we, we, we can't even talk. We can't even talk about it. You can talk about it and get two hundred fifty-eight thousand nine hundred forty views at the time of this video. So you can talk about it and you can get a pretty large audience talking about it. A lot of this is just absolutely crazy. He's talking about. I think implicitly he seems to be saying this. The Chinese government was creating these propaganda videos for us to all think COVID's really bad. It is really bad. Three hundred five thousand people have died in the US from it. He's saying it was all kind of, you know, this strange propaganda. And yet at the same time, we have the genome of COVID-19 available to the scientific community and, a, you know, a viral vaccine already being created in America by January the 13th. So it, it was a thing and it was being addressed and it was being taken seriously. And then he talks about the Chinese economy. Well, the Chinese economy is growing by one point something percent. That's still the lowest growth, by the way, for China's economy in my lifetime. China for 30 years has been posting growth of eight to 10% per year, right? Which is how it goes from absolutely nowhere in 1990 to the world's second largest economy today and the world's largest economy within a decade or two. So the idea is posting 1.5% growth and wow, that, that's probably quite bad for China. It needs actually significantly higher than that to really, to keep the momentum it's had in recent decades. And yeah, again, we see this whole thing of, why don't you follow through with your own point? You're saying that the US has had poor economic performance and it's had a shutdown and you don't get the same quality of life you see in China, East Asia. They've still got the nightclubs open in Wuhan. Yeah, maybe it's because we completely mishandled this thing. Maybe it's because the state has a fundamentally different role in society in China and South Korea and Japan and Vietnam to what it has in the United States and Britain. And since when was Paul Joseph Watson a critic of Amazon? Since when was Candice Owens a critic of monopoly capitalism? These guys have been calling this stuff the free market for 10 years. Like, oh, it's the free, if you don't like the free market, go somewhere else. And now they're attacking the free market. It's absolutely true what he's saying. Amazon has benefited to an extraordinary extent from this pandemic, you know. Today, Amazon is the world's most valuable company. It's worth about 1.5 trillion US dollars. You know, it's about the same as the GDP of Australia, slightly smaller than the GDP of Canada. We're talking as a big, wealthy country, one business. And Jeff Bezos himself is by far the world's wealthiest person. You know, he's going to be worth about $200 billion soon. In a single day this year, Jeff Bezos' wealth increased by $13 billion. One day. No, it's ridiculous. We had a rule at a 10 p.m. curfew where everyone was thrown out of the bars at 10 p.m. They all congregated on the streets and just had street parties. Now in <laughs> Wales, the government is saying pubs can't serve alcohol as if you're more susceptible to the virus if you're drinking alcohol. That's going to put those pubs, those restaurants even further into the mire. And then we have the vaccine, of course. You've had the debate in the US, but it's come to the fore more in the UK with companies and airlines now saying, suggesting that you won't be allowed to enter a bar, a restaurant, cinema, sports stadium, or any other kind of similar venue if you don't take the vaccine. So we have the government saying, oh, we're not going to make it mandatory, but you're not going to be able to travel or have any kind of social life if you don't take it. So again, it's this kind wait, of- Wait, 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 we're going to carry on a second. Just... You can't travel if you don't take a vaccine. Well, guess what, Paul? You, you can't do that for quite a few countries already. You know, you can't go to anywhere you like anywhere in the world without taking a bunch of vaccines, right? That's just, that's simply not how it works. I'm pretty sure you've had vaccines as a child. I'm actually pretty sure you'll be vaccinated for COVID-19 because you want to do normal things again. I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's true. Given that we've seen polls, Candice, in the UK, and it's probably even greater in the US, that show 36% of people are very unlikely to take the vaccine. So a bars, restaurants, sports stadium is really going to take that financial hit to carry through this compulsory vaccine policy, or do you see that falling by the wayside? 36% of people is a minority. That means 64% of people want to do it. And you can be absolutely sure once people know their friends and family are doing it and things are to some extent returning to normal, more people want to do it. Sure, you're going to have 15% of people who don't want to have this vaccine. I think that's probably the case. But you can't appeal to 36% of the population and say this thing hasn't got mass buy-in because 
by virtue of basic mathematics, you're wrong. I see it falling by the wayside, and I will say this. I have already spoken out and said I will not be taking the vaccine. I've been saying this since February. I knew this was coming. Um, it makes no sense. There's a 99% chance that you're going to survive if you get COVID-19. Why the hell would you take a, a vaccine that has 94% effective and causes you to be sick? 99% of people that don't get COVID survive. Well, that means one in 100 people die. The United States has a population of around 325 million people. So you work out how many deaths that is. It's around 3.25 million deaths if everybody in the United States gets COVID, which will eventually happen, by the way, because it's not just going to disappear. It's like the cold, it's like the flu. It's going to be effectively subject to seasonal spikes year on year on year. So she's basically saying, we don't need a vaccine because only 3.25 million people will die. I mean, what other context would that be normal? And then she says something even more stupid, which is that only has a 94% uh, efficacy rate, which is to say it works 94 times out of 100, that's among the highest efficacy rates of any vaccine. Of any vaccine. You don't need it to be 100% to be effective. 94% is up there with, you know, the absolute best vaccines. The idea that you don't want to do it because uh, it's only 94% effective is so crazy. But again, you know, how is it possible that somebody who says it's perfectly fine to have 3.25 million people die in the U US, how is it possible they have such wide influence? I won't be taking it, but I do want to say as a reminder to everybody who's watching, um, if there's one thing that every society in the entire world that has had slaves has had in common. What does every society in the entire world that has had slaves had in common? And the answer is, is that there was always more slaves than there were masters. I keep that in my mind um, when I when I go through and I think about things. There is always going to be more of us than them. You know, if we say no, it's a no. Um, you know, if, if we decide that, okay, you say that I can't fly unless I get this vaccine, let's just not fly for a year. Eventually, they're going to have to come too because it's going to hurt them. Um, so, you know, I, I think every person should do their best with the information that they have available. The vaccine is not for Candace Owens. The vaccine will not be taken in my family and it won't be given to my children. And that's the most that I can say about that. Is this now, like, I'm anti-vax? Is that it? Measles, mumps, rubella, all these things which kill... The infant mortality, Candice, was really high until we had these things. Like, children died all of the time until we had inoculations, vac vaccinations, immunizations. All the time. You know, one of the, one of the principal reasons why life expectancy increased at the turn of the century, early 20th century, is because of all of these measures which you want to roll back for no particular reason and she's saying and i find this so funny we're, we're slaves you know in this society the people that don't want to take the vaccine are slaves this is from somebody who says you shouldn't tear down a statue of slave traders but we're slaves if we don't want to take a vaccine in the 21st century to not die of something i mean i want i want it to make sense but it doesn't and i think just listening to that clip for eight minutes really shows you the extraordinary extent to which COVID-19, and I think 2020 generally, has just denuded any political coherence these people had. What is their political project now? Now that Trump is gone, now that the economic growth since 2008, there's a bump of it under Trump, that's kind of gone too. We've got mass unemployment, people face being thrown out of their homes. You've got climate change down the road. You've got the kind of transition of power, the shift of power from west to east. We're looking at all this stuff in 2020, right? And, and what can they talk about? Not taking a vaccine. That's their big political commitment. We're, we're not going to take a vaccine. We'll, we'll chance it. There's a one in 100 chance I'll die. I have 500 friends on Facebook. I have no problem with five of them dying. That, that's their big political commitment post-Trump. And I think it asks big questions, particularly the mainstream media, because both of these people have appeared on a number of outlets. They've been allowed to be quite influential. And look, they're allowed to be influential in so much as they're allowed freedom of expression. I don't think they should be denied that. But these exact arguments peddled by other people vicariously, people like Nigel Farage, have taken centre stage in the British media for decades. I'm not just talking about the tabloids, the gutter press, we knew that. But very frequently it's been mainstreamed, it's been buttressed, it's been given rocket fuel uh, by the BBC and by other media outlets too. And I think it's time that stops because you watch this clip and you think, these people are insane. How on earth is this in any way reflective of even a modicum of public opinion. But the tragedy is it is. We're a species that can create the vaccine to a pathogen within two days of sequencing the genome of it, but we also have these idiots, right? And that's the tragedy of humanity. Alexander Pope, you know, he talks about it. Essay on man, into endless error hurled the glory, jest and riddle of the world. Well, the glory is the, is the vaccine, 
And the jest is these guys, they're idiots.